It was a hot, sticky day on a Thursday afternoon of 18th of May 1989 in a crowded playground called Martin Luther King in Harlem, which was close to the tower block of 41 West 112th Street, Lenox Avenue, of where two-year-old Christopher Dansby lived, along with Alison, his mother, and Levan, his brother, who was just a year older. That afternoon was like any other, as Alison and her mother and sister decided to take the children to the playground. This is something that they did often together, and also go into a store nearby to pick up some snacks for the children. So on this day, it was after 5pm and Alison and the other family members were watching the children play, when Alison decided to nip to the store, leaving Christopher and Levan behind with their grandmother. It was about 30 minutes later and Alison returned and looked for Christopher amongst all the children playing, including Levan. When she couldn't see him, Alison asked her family as to the whereabouts of Christopher. They replied how he was just playing close to them with a red ball and two other children, a girl of 10 and a boy aged 5. Alison started to panic as she couldn't spot Christopher anywhere. The grandmother and aunt went to help search the playground. As Alison ran around frantically calling her son's name, told her family that Christopher didn't even bring a red ball and there was no sign of either a ball or the two children that they had described playing with. In a matter of time, police were called in the search for two-year-old Christopher and the NYPD searched the 10 tower blocks, each with over 14 floors and multiple apartments. A helicopter was brought in to fly overhead, covering huge areas, and also divers searched Harlem Mere, a lake nearby. Sniffer dogs were also in attendance, using Christopher's clothing as a scent that got picked up from the playground and led the investigators to 110th Street, where it stopped. The investigators thought that it was at this point Christopher could have been put into a car. Christopher's dad flew in from Florida to help with the inquiries because although he didn't really have any contact with him, it was important to prove that he had nothing to do with Christopher's disappearance, which was soon determined by the police that he didn't have any involvement. Christopher's case left the community shocked, but with no further leads, there were no answers as to the whereabouts of two-year-old Christopher Dansby. Unfortunately, tragedy struck again in an almost identical circumstance when less than three months later another little boy was snatched, 19-month-old Shane Walker, who coincidentally was from the same block as Christopher was. On Thursday, 10th of August, roughly the same time of after 5pm, Rosa Glover took her son Shane to get some snacks and then taken Shane to the Martin Luther King playground. It was typically crowded when two children approached Rosa asking her if they could play with Shane. Rosa thought it was odd as the girl was 10 and the boy was 6. So Rosa initially said no as she thought they were too old. But after they persisted Rosa gave in and said you can take him down the slide. Rosa then went on to go and sit on a bench opposite. Within moments, a man came and sat next to Rosa. He started to make conversation about the surgical scars he had on his body. And then he said to Rosa how a little boy had been abducted from the park a couple of months earlier and how the kids are not safe. This shocked Rosa as it was noted that she said that if she had known, she would never have taken Shane there. Rosa looked to where her son and the kids had been playing and realised she couldn't see them anymore. Rosa got up and immediately called for Shane, searching the playground back and forth. She finally saw the boy and girl that Shane had been playing with. Climbing through a fence, she asked them where Shane was and they replied that they had left him in the playground. With no sign of Shane, devastated Rosa called police. A search for the second time in 1989 happened with no stone left unturned. The man on the bench was questioned, but NYPD ruled him out as having any involvement. Also, the two children that was with Shane 
were confirmed to be the same two that was playing with Christopher three months earlier. They were also questioned, along with their parents, and strangely, even though both toddlers were last seen with these kids before they disappeared, the children in the end were also ruled out. Nobody could help with any leads, and Shane, along with Christopher Dansby, were never to be seen again. A $30,000 reward was offered, as NYPD said, with both cases being identical, two boys of a similar age, both lived at the same Martin Luther King Tower block, both snatched from the same playground on a Thursday, same time of evening, and both had been playing with the same two children before disappearing. Theories at the time were that there was a baby selling ring going on, a child trafficking for adoption or a paedophile ring, and also something that was rampant in the 80s, which was satanic ritual abuse. Either way, none of this produced any results. Days after Shane's disappearance, Rosa got a phone call from an anonymous caller saying Shane was buried in a vacant building on 113th Street, Lennox Avenue. Police demolished the place looking for Shane, but still nothing came of it. There was another case that could potentially be connected to Christopher Dansby's and Shane Walker's cases, and that was one that happened on the 29th of March 1989 in Brooklyn, two months before Christopher went missing. And that was Monique Rivera and her baby son, Andre Bryant, who was only a couple months old. Monique was a mother of three and living in Brooklyn, when one day in March, Monique took her three kids shopping at Green Acres Shopping Mall, when Monique met up with two other women. Information suggests that Monique knew one of the women from school. These women paid for Monique and her kids' lunches and then went and bought clothes for Monique which had been paid for with a stolen credit card at a store called Canadians. The next day, Monique had arranged to meet up with these women again for another shopping trip. So Monique's sister was to come and look after her three children. But when one of the women phoned up for Monique using a payphone, they insisted Monique to bring baby Andre with her, which she did. The shopping trip was meant to be at the Galleria Mall in Westchester County. Monique and Andre were last seen getting into a 1988 to 1989 Burgundy Pontiac Grand Am. That would be the last time anybody would see Andre, as the next day Monique's body was found on the shore of East Chester Bay. She had been bludgeoned and strangled with her own scarf. Police searched the bay and the surrounding area looking for Andre, but to no avail. A couple of days later, a woman phoned up and asked for Monique. The family member answering the phone call told the caller that Monique was dead. The woman replied, she can't be dead. I was just shopping with her the last two days. The caller provided the name of Joan Walker, not a known relative of Shane Walker and an address. Neither name or address could be checked out as they seemingly didn't exist. Nobody has been found in the connection of Monique's murder and Andre's abduction. The theory that it could be connected to the cases in the Martin Luther King playground were of an illegal adoption ring. There was a description of the two women Monique was seen with, and that was that of one was black at around 35 and the other was Hispanic with orange hair but that is about it. Christopher Dansby and Shane Walker's family still have hope that one day they'll see their children again. Thank you for watching Dark Crime Time. Please like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification button.